Welcome to the first CITP conference of the year. Uh, I am Nick Feimster. I'm a professor in the computer science department here. I am also the acting director of the Center for IT Policy here at Princeton for uh, about the next 18 months, while our uh, founding director at Felton is is um, is on leave at the White House. So um, I wanted to uh, thank. Thank Ed for this opportunity to, to lead the center and um, during a very exciting time. Uh, so this, um, uh, this first conference, as you know, is on internet censorship. And uh, we've got a very exciting uh, set of speakers and panelists lined up today. Uh, and um, since I have the podium for a minute, before I introduce our speaker, I will also call your attention to a few other things that are going on at CITP uh, this fall. Um, one, for those of you who are at Princeton, we are uh, very uh, fortunate to have uh, Microsoft, uh, who's given some money to start a new seed grant program between um, technology and policy. So we're we are um, about to begin soliciting um, sort of seed grant proposals from uh, groups of pairs of researchers or groups of researchers. The main stipulation of that is uh, you need to have one researcher in technology and one in in policy, so um, so keep keep an eye out for that. The other thing that's coming up, which uh, might not be on your radar because CIT, uh, it's it's new for CITP, is we will be uh, organizing a hackathon on December fourth on the topic of transportation. Um, so keep an eye out for that. There'll be there'll be more news on that. Um, and there's there's uh, lots of other stuff that's going to happen in the spring that I can't tell you about because it's not fully organized yet, but I, I wanted to draw your attention to those new and exciting things on top of uh, everything that CITP is already doing. So at this point, I'll introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, who is uh, Wendy Seltzer. Many of you probably know Wendy because uh, she was a fellow here many years ago, and we're very fortunate to have her back today to speak to us. Currently, um, uh, uh, well, so Wendy's been, been certainly all over the place, but currently she's at um, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium uh, as counsel, and she is uh, working on various standards activities involving security there. And uh, when I asked for a topic uh, that, sh that she's going to tell us about today, she said she's going to talk about the opposite of censorship. So um, I think that's a very apt topic, and I'm, uh, I will now turn it over to Wendy for our first keynote. So thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it's really wonderful to, to be back here at CITP. It's a, a fantastic sort of confluence of technology, policy, um, and society. So uh, it's great for me as a lead of the technology and society domain at the World Wide Web Consortium uh, to, to come and uh, have a chance to, to talk with you. Um, of course, everything I say here is uh, my personal rem remarks and not to be attributed to the policies of uh, W3C or uh, the TOR project or the Chilling Effects project or uh, other things um, that I'm working with. So I wanted to uh, talk with you uh, about the opposite of censorship because uh, I wanted to help uh, set the frame for uh, the discussions that you've had over uh, the workshop and the discussions uh, to come. Um, I, I see fabulous panels lined up to talk about measurement and uh, understanding political conditions and understanding the technical uh, conditions that uh, foster and help to fight against uh, censorship uh, online. And I uh, wanted to take uh, a brief uh, step back to look at, you know, how do, what are we uh, fighting for uh, when we fight against censorship? And uh, how can we uh, continue to foster the vibrant, open internet of dialogue, of free expression, of uh, interoperability, of interaction, of mashups and uh, innovation? Um, and uh, how do we uh, continue to, uh, to preserve and extend the conditions that have uh, enabled that development? Uh, and then I will uh, address some of the uh, the chills that uh, that I see uh, that are uh, th threatening to restrict that, uh, some of which we don't designate explicitly as uh, censorship, uh, and others uh, that are 
uh, more uh, free-floating, sort of chilling effects uh, on free expression, and uh, I think nonetheless we need to uh, respond to. Uh, so the enablers of, 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 of open communication and uh, innovation, uh, we've all seen the uh, tremendous rise of uh, the distributed networks, the, the, the internet enabled uh, communications, uh, the, the lower cost of access, the lower costs of uh, technology, and uh, the lower costs then of communicating about those designs and products uh, has, uh, as we've seen, led to uh, a flourishing of uh, independent and distributed uh, communications media. So. Uh, it's not just that it's uh, cheap to set up a blog uh, or uh, cheap to get an internet access account. Uh, it's cheap to reach out to uh, others and uh, be heard uh, over the networks. Uh, the, the connectivity among those uh, platforms, uh, it's cheap to make a hyperlink and easy to uh, engage with people across platforms. The hyperlink uh, even if you're in a, uh, in one system, uh, one web application or uh, an application, uh, the hyperlink lets you reach out across uh, applications to, uh, to other platforms and uh, other sources uh, of expression. And the infrastructure um, underneath uh, the, these communications uh, is widespread here in the United States, not as widespread as uh, we might uh, like everywhere, but uh, most of us can get access to uh, internet technologies and uh, in an ever increasing number of uh, ways, wired and wireless on devices and uh, fixed platforms. And um, we keep fighting for the neutrality of those infrastructures uh, to assure that uh, whatever we dream up uh, and whatever others dream up will be able to interoperate uh, on those uh, platforms and uh, that uh, the, the newcomers will have similar access to uh, the now uh, established platforms of the Googles and Twitters and Facebooks. Those were startups <laughs> uh, not too long ago and we need to make sure to, that, that we're preserving uh, the space for the startups of uh, tomorrow uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the interoperability, uh, that all of these things, I'm a standards person, I have to talk about interoperability, but uh, not just um, uh, as a standards person, but be because uh, the, the common standards form uh, a common language by which not just the people, uh, but the technologies can talk uh, to one another. Uh, so. Uh, we benefit on the internet from a whole stack of uh, standards uh, from the underlying uh, physical interconnectivity to the, the protocols of TCP IP uh, to the application layer, uh, languages of uh, HTTP and HTML. Um, and by connecting uh, those together uh, without asking permission from their designers or implementers, uh, anyone can uh, can build on top uh, of the web platform. Anyone can design a new web application and deploy it, uh, and if it picks up speed um, and interest, uh, as long as they can uh, fulfill the server capacity to, to serve it up, uh, they can, uh, can, can reach the, uh, the world. Uh, so, uh, and uh, at W3C and uh, at IETF and uh, other standards bodies, uh, we maintain a global multi-stakeholder uh, conversation about how those standards should evolve, not to uh, any uh, single uh, application's interest, but to maintain uh, the open platform for uh, access by new technologies. And um, we, we build standards to uh, enable the open communication, and we build standards to enable the secure communication. Uh, so one of the big uh, pushes uh, of uh, my work 
uh, right now at W3C uh, is to uh, enable secure web communication and to help get that uh, widely deployed uh, because when users connect to the web, they want uh, assurance that uh, their communication is uh, untampered with, uh, unsnooped upon, uh, that they're getting access to uh, the, the data that they asked for, uh, it's integrity protected, um, and all of that. Uh, well, HTTP is a great uh, interconnection. Uh, without more on top, uh, we don't have any of those uh, guarantees. So uh, moving more people over to uh, uh, the TLS, moving them over to HTTPS and uh, assuring that uh, secure infrastructure is backing that and uh, secure standards are uh, encouraging more uh, sites to uh, adopt those uh, protections. Um, and so we have you know, a, a, a flourishing of, of activities that are helping to, uh, to support that uh, encryption everywhere, encryption end to end, uh, in order to uh, enable people to, to take control of their communications and uh, assure that uh, even when broadcast, uh, they're reaching uh, people as intended, uh, and when point to point, they're reaching only the people uh, to, to, for whom they were intended. Uh, so projects at you know, a range of, of layers, uh, as we said. Um, uh, in IETF, there's uh, been uh, now a uh, couple of years uh, movement uh, around resistance to pervasive monitoring, uh, looking at uh, the, the design of protocols to uh, recognize that we need to take security uh, and security against the pervasive monitoring uh, as a core design principle. Uh, where will, uh, where might data leak uh, unexpectedly or unintendedly, and how can we uh, build the protocols to uh, assure protection? Uh, how can we make sure that we're not accidentally leaking uh, domain name lookup information, that we're not accidentally leaking uh, web metadata uh, as we browse. Um, and so over at, uh, at W3C then, uh, we have uh, various standards underway to make it easier for people to, to move their uh, sites to HTTPS and to encourage uh, designers of new uh, features to make them available only um, in a secure fashion so that users of uh, a web browser don't have to ask, you know, will my location data and personal information be leaked over an insecure connection if I allow access to my uh, location, uh, but rather uh, designers of applications and browsers should uh, enable that only over a secure uh, communication channel, only over an uh, authenticated and integrity protected channel uh, so that the, the user uh, knows to whom they're sending that information and uh, can make uh, a real choice uh, about what they're doing. Um, this is supported by uh, efforts like the Let's Encrypt project, uh, which is spinning up a certificate authority to enable anyone to uh, get a, a, an SSL certificate and uh, as the root of, uh, of trust for their site. You know, instead of making it a barrier that you need to, to go and pay uh, and uh, for a certificate, let's make it as easy as possible and as easy technically uh, as possible for people to deploy that so that it becomes the norm uh, that online communications are uh, encrypted and uh, protected. Um, so, um, uh, so, so specs like uh, the uh, upgrade insecure requests are helping people to uh, HTTPS enable uh, existing sites, uh, and then uh, mechanisms like mixed content blocking and um, uh, the, the secure context restrictions uh, help to assure that when users uh, web users or web developers are asking for a secured connection, uh, they're getting a connection that, that's truly secured. And together, these, these features uh, help to, to preserve the 
the web and the internet's uh, generativity, uh, Jonathan Zittrain's uh, phrase for uh, the ability to, to leverage the web and web technologies for new uses uh, as well as for those we already know about. That we're not uh, designing a web that uh, works just for uh, a particular form of communication uh, or just for video or just for text, but rather uh, a web that can be leveraged and uh, built upon uh, as new technologies roll out and as new needs and capabilities uh, meld into new platform features. Uh, WebRTC uh, coming along with uh, real-time audio-video communication. We need to uh, watch that it's uh, security and privacy uh, features are uh, up to snuff to enab uh, enable uh, this vibrant point-to-point uh, -point and uh, inter interaction. So we've got uh, we, we've got a wonderful web of uh, of new technologies of uh, of communications and uh, of possibilities. Um, but we are here at a censorship conference, and uh, we are uh, constantly on the lookout for uh, how people um, and entities and regimes uh, are looking to restrict that. Um, and so um, one of uh, my research concerns uh, has been in the, notion, uh, in the area of, uh, of chilling effects, um, the, the concern that uh, we can we can easily identify, uh, or uh, we, we, we can uh, at, at least more quickly identify uh, the direct uh, legal restrictions on uh, activity, uh, the, the laws that prohibit uh, speech, uh, or the laws that prohibit access to uh, material uh, are clearly restricting communication. Um, but uh, there's also sort of uh, a shadow around those laws that is um, restricting people's uh, ability or interest uh, in speaking uh, or experimenting uh, that, that's also uh, of great concern. Uh, so um, in the United States, uh, we have um, well, institutions of intermediary liability uh, that uh, where service providers are concerned about uh, the liability they might face for their users' um, online activity and pass those restrictions on to users uh, in ways that it may be hard for, uh, for users to escape. Uh, so the Chilling Effects Project has uh, done a lot of documentation around the uh, effects uh, in the United States uh, and around the world uh, of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, the, and its copyright notice and takedown provisions. So on the one hand, uh, this law has been a great uh, boon to internet service providers um, in that it says explicitly that they are not liable for uh, user-generated copyright infringements of which they are unaware. Uh, so and service providers can uh, enable users to post blogs, post videos, post music, uh, create mashups uh, without upfront filtering that or censoring that content um, for uh, the, the, the possible copyright infringements uh, that someone might claim. Uh, and that's great. And that allows uh, YouTube to uh, an enable a platform that allows the uploading of uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of video in, uh, in minutes uh, without uh, putting a screen up that mean, uh, requires uh, a pre-examination uh, of that material. Uh, it allows uh, uh, Pinterest to allow, in, enable people to, to post photographs and uh, without pre-screening. It enables a new service to set up and offer any of those things um, as long as they register their, their agent for service of copyright notices. But uh, the, 
but it, it also includes the notice and takedown provision that says that uh, once the service provider uh, is given notice of a claimed copyright infringement, um, it needs to uh, act to remove the infringing material or disable access to it, or uh, it will lose its immunity from liability. Uh, now there's a whole um, involved, uh, th there's still a legal question about whether uh, it faces liability um, if it doesn't uh, remove the material, but uh, the, the incentive scheme that DMCA has set up um, has led to uh, providers forwarding those notices on to their end users and uh, disabling access to material, um, terminating accounts uh, of people held to be uh, repeat infringers, uh, and the individuals um, at the end of the chain uh, often feel that they have uh, little recourse. Uh, it's difficult to challenge the, um, the notices they feel, uh, and uh, so material remains down, and individuals shrink from the posting of uh, mashups and parodies and uh, remixes that use copyrighted content, but not in a way that would infringe the copyright, uh, because the determination of fair use is a murky one, and uh, they fear that the, uh, the, the cost of fighting it out um, w would be too high. Now we have had some uh, significant victories um, in that uh, front. Uh, just recently uh, in the uh, case of the, the dancing baby, uh, the uh, lens uh, copyright case that uh, started uh, several years ago uh, when uh, the, uh, the mother of a then baby uh, posted uh, a video clip of the baby dancing to a Prince song and uh, YouTube uh, got to YouTube uh, where uh, Universal Music sent a, a copyright takedown notice arguing that this was infringing their copyright. Automated detection had recognized the song in the background, uh, said that this was an infringement and uh, shut down uh, the video. Stephanie Lenz decided uh, this was worth fighting for because nobody was going to use uh, her dancing baby video as a substitute for purchasing the music track or uh, any music video that Universal Music might have made uh, and uh, so fought the uh, claim of infringement and uh, ultimately after uh, quite a battle uh, won, the, uh, won the argument not only that this was not likely to be infringement, uh, but that it was uh, not even uh, a legitimate copyright takedown complaint from uh, Universal. That by uh, failing to examine the, uh, the material that had been posted and to recognize that not every use of their music uh, is an infringement of copyright, uh, they were unfairly squashing uh, what's free expression uh, and not infringement. Um, so each of those uh, copyright misuse um, arguments opens up a little bit more space uh, against the chill, opens up uh, a little bit more opportunity for uh, individuals to realize that they can build upon the cultural properties that they see around them, they can use uh, music in dialogue and in uh, entertainment uh, without having to uh, get a license for every single uh, use there. Uh, and that opens up a, a little bit more space for uh, the platforms to remind their users about opportunities to push back and uh, opportunities to, uh, to challenge the, uh, the, the legal demand. Uh, so the Chilling Effects Project has been collecting uh, these takedown notices from, uh, uh, from uh, intermediaries uh, who've received them um, and uh, publishing that as a data set uh, where we can notice not only the, yes, there is quite a bit of um, infringement for which people are legitimately being notified and asked to, be, to take down 
uh, their postings of somebody else's music track or somebody else's video. Uh, and, there are, and, and yet there are also uh, a range of, uh, of parodies and uh, entirely non-infringing uh, works uh, that are being subject to this takedown. Um, and uh, one of the exciting uh, developments in the, the, the chilling effects world um, is uh, looking to internationalize uh, that data set. Uh, so we've been, uh, been open to uh, international um, material and uh, one of uh, the, the areas uh, we, we currently see um, is the uh, notices to Twitter demanding removal of country-specific uh, access to tweets. Uh, so Twitter, based in the United States, um, responds uh, to US law uh, globally by removing uh, the material. But uh, apart from uh, some concerns with DMCA, US law is by and large very friendly to, to online uh, expression. Uh, so uh, US law uh, uh, includes the, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, uh, which says that uh, apart from intellectual property and criminal law, service providers are flat out not responsible for uh, their users' postings. Um, and uh, that frees up providers to uh, enable uh, a wide range of, of expression on their platforms if they're US-based. Um, but uh, providers who are operating internationally uh, are also looking to the rules uh, that, uh, that other regimes uh, impose. And if they want to preserve their ability to do business in uh, multiple countries outside the United States, they uh, feel compelled to respond not just to US laws, uh, but to those of France and Turkey and Germany and Russia uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. And so Twitter has uh, opted to uh, selectively disable access to material where uh, they get a complaint of violation of a sp national law that, does, uh, that would not violate uh, U.S. law. So when someone complains in uh, France of a violation of uh, a hate speech law, uh, which are stricter uh, there than uh, in the United States, uh, Twitter might disable access to the tweets in France, uh, country-specific uh, access, but leave them open to uh, viewing by uh, users elsewhere. That uh, both enables researchers to, to look at the, the comparison, what are the, the comparative effects of these different uh, legal regimes, um, and it allows users to continue to have a discussion of what are the appropriate boundaries of, uh, of speech and uh, unlawful speech. Uh, so uh, among the uh, recent uh, splits between uh, US uh, and European law, the right to be forgotten uh, is casting lots of waves uh, overseas. And uh, because uh, as a protection of uh, privacy and dignity interests, uh, the Europeans have said that uh, not only do you have a right not to be defamed um, online, uh, you have the right to remove uh, from online reporting uh, past truthful reports that no longer uh, are at, that are no longer accurate or that appear too high in the rankings so that somebody finding uh, that material gets an inaccurate picture of your present uh, activities. Now this is a legitimate concern for people. You know, they want to be por portrayed accurately online and when uh, typing your name into a search engine is one of the fastest ways to find out uh, who somebody is, um, people are rightly concerned if uh, bad stuff appears uh, from 10 years ago at the top of, of the listings. But the uh, insistence that 
uh, search engines remove that material entirely, um, I think cuts too far in the other direction. It make, prevents people from uh, getting the full picture of, uh, of those that they're looking to engage in conversation or do business with. And um, moreover, the implementation of the, the right to be forgotten uh, has gone so far as uh, to tell providers uh, that they have to delete uh, links to news articles about the right to be forgotten and its uh, alleged overreach. Uh, so if a news, so when a uh, British newspaper writes an article uh, about having to remove articles from its online archive uh, because uh, their subjects no longer wanted them accessed, um, we're, we're losing access to the reporting uh, and to the history around the, uh, the law and losing access to, uh, to be able to, to see the laws and, and report on uh, the law's impact. Uh, so chilling effects has been working to, uh, in a way that is consistent with uh, the European data privacy uh, law to get uh, access to information about uh, these right to be forgotten requests. If we can't have the names and we can't have the articles that uh, describe the, the response around the names, uh, can we get numbers, can we get um, some sort of uh, metadata, if you will, uh, that would enable researchers not to out individuals for having a bad debt 10 years ago, uh, but to uh, analyze the, the effects that this law is having on public discourse. Are creditors making better or worse decisions based on uh, the availability of information? Uh, are politicians able to hide uh, bad episodes from their past when they want to enter public life? Uh, or is the public uh, able to, uh, to, to get the relevant uh, information to make uh, informed decisions? Uh, so we're still, we're working on uh, changes to uh, collection platforms and uh, internationalization of the platform itself to be able to host data in places that uh, can comply with uh, European uh, concerns and provide access to academic researchers uh, to understand uh, the, the impact here. Um, so, um, and uh, as part of that change, we've uh, revamped the, the, the platform on which Chilling Effects runs. Uh, we've uh, opened up APIs for uh, research data access and um, look forward to, to talking with more folks about uh, how that information uh, might be useful uh, to, to your work. Uh, and I, so we have um, the, the, the chilling effects of, of self-censorship, um, not only um, in the case of, sort of content restriction laws like uh, DMCA, um, but also uh, in the U.S. on sort of technology restrictive laws um, like uh, the DMCA's anti-circumvention provisions um, or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, pieces of law that uh, uh, make it more difficult to uh, investigate the workings of technology and build new uh, interoperable pieces on top uh, because, uh, they've, uh, because their uh, provisions have uh, tended to be interpreted in a Sort of in too bright line uh, a fashion. So uh, DMCA section 1201 uh, criminalizes the uh, circumvention of technological measures used to protect a copyrighted work um, and um, has been used to stop uh, people from even investigating the, the security of systems to uh, protect copyrighted works. Uh, the yeah, and uh, only uh, 
um, um, among the, the latest uh, invocations of, of DMCA and uh, its exemptions when, when Volkswagen was revealed uh, to have been cheating the uh, auto emissions tests by uh, altering the firmware in its uh, emissions controllers or by, by uh, that firmware responding differently when a tester was plugged in uh, to when the car was driving on the road. Um, researchers who might have wanted to investigate that software um, were deterred by the, uh, the, the anti-circumvention provisions uh, because that software is a copyrighted work. Uh, it has mechanisms preventing people from copying it. Um, if those mechanisms have the side effect of uh, making it more difficult to examine uh, and study the work, it's still, uh, th there is no strong uh, research exemption. Uh, and ironically, uh, shortly before the, uh, the, the Volkswagen uh, cheat was uh, publicized, the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency had uh, opposed a DMCA exemption for uh, investigating uh, automobile software on the grounds that uh, the exemption would make it too easy for individuals to uh, tune their cars in a way that cheated uh, emission standards. Uh, so finding ways to uh, enable research to uh, on software to enable experimentation uh, without uh, crossing the line and uh, enabling uh, the uh, the law breaking, I think, needs a bit more uh, leeway. We need a bit more opportunity uh, for researchers and uh, experimentation. Uh, so, um, the, the opposite uh, of, of censorship, um, I think, is the, uh, the, the tremendous flourishing of, uh, of creativity uh, that we've seen. Uh, the antidote um, to, to censorship and uh, the resistance to uh, the, the chill of, uh, of law and, uh, and self-censorship, uh, I think, comes from the uh, technologists and policy makers uh, encouraging uh, leeway. Let's make sure that we leave room for uh, experimentation leave room for uh, interoperability. Uh, don't push the law to its limit and uh, engage in punitive uh, restrictions on people who are uh, just, who are testing the boundaries. Because it's only by testing the boundaries uh, and sometimes stepping over them that we uh, find out what's possible and what else should be allowed. Um, so, you know, I, I started my uh, cyber law uh, career uh, with Lawrence Lessig and thinking about the uh, law, code, norms, and markets, the multiple ways in which we uh, can engage in regulation. And I think uh, as we, one of the, the, the benefits uh, that law has long had uh, has been its development through common law and precedent and experimentation, we recognize that sometimes judges get it wrong and we uh, have room for appeals. Uh, and we recognize that a lot of the law needs to be learned through experience and developed not through uh, setting down strictures uh, in advance of knowing the landscape, uh, but rather in seeing where things go wrong and making corrections to the law the development of tort law grew around railroads and grew around the nuisance factories that were set up and uh, around the problems of its time. Um, we need to engage in more uh, common law development. We need to engage in more investigation of what are the actual problems of copyright online? What are the actual problems of uh, computer fraud? And how can we respond to those uh, in ways that are tailored to uh, the problems that people cause uh, and not preemptively shut out uh, a lot of lawful experimentation. What are the problems of too much expression? Well, there are, 
there are clearly problems. We uh, don't uh, want to encourage uh, widespread defamation. We don't want to encourage widespread in invasions of privacy. Uh, we don't want to encourage spam and um, other unwanted uh, communications. Uh, but the ways to go after those, I think, are not to uh, set broad punitive laws that punish uh, someone who uh, identifiably steps over the line while uh, leaving um, a range of people uh, afraid to experiment uh, up to that line, but it requires reaching out to some of the other, uh, those other areas of, let's think about technology that can be uh, tuned uh, to, to the problems that we face and uh, giving hooks and affordances in our technology design uh, to uh, laws that make the right choices. Uh, and to, to the social norms that we develop around our communications to fostering uh, good communities and good um, interchange uh, without, uh, uh, without uh, going too far in restricting um, other opportunities. Um, and uh, it comes to the, the marketplace of enabling uh, competition and uh, making sure that uh, the, the technology platforms remain open to uh, experimentation, that there are always opportunities to build a new hyperlink, to write a new web application, uh, to build new communication channels uh, and new protocols and uh, to uh, experiment further. So I look forward to uh, sharing more throughout the day with you. Um, so, uh, service providers are free to, to reject uh, takedown requests, and if there would be no liability, uh, because there's clearly no infringement, um, then, uh, and then they can uh, reject it with, with little risk. Um, I, a challenge for anyone in this ecosystem is scaling that. Um, so, now, on whom do we want to put the burden of investigating? Uh, I'd like to, to put it back on the, the sender of the, the notice uh, and to make it easier for uh, users and service providers to, to challenge the sending of bogus takedowns. Or uh, maybe we need something of the equivalent of the, uh, the, the private attorney general, anyone harmed by inability to access uh, material that was falsely taken down. Uh, can challenge a wrongful takedown. And if something was, you know, um, a takedown for anything with Eclipse in the name that takes down NASA uh, videos along with uh, the, the copyrighted movie there, uh, that should be uh, a pretty easy uh, pushback against the sender. What, one final question. It's, 
So the, 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 the cross-jurisdictional nature of the internet, um, I think it's both challenge and opportunity. One of the, re uh, the reasons that uh, people point to for why we have Silicon Valley in the United States as a uh, uh, real flowering place for new technologies and communications uh, is that the laws have uh, supported tech uh, experimentation. Um, and then given it enough of a, uh, a boost to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get started and then to, to challenge restrictions uh, in other countries. So one of, and uh, conversely, one of the reasons that DMCA uh, gives us the, the problems that it does uh, is that that comes as implementation of uh, WIPO copyright treaties, so it wasn't just U.S. lawmakers saying uh, we need to do this to protect copyright interests um, and can take account of the free expression concerns uh, that United States law recognizes. Uh, it was a perceived need to harmonize copyright regimes uh, around the world that perhaps made us do more than uh, we otherwise should have. Okay, great. So let's, let's thank Wendy.